The last few decades have reversed Boston's long decline in population. The growth has been a factor also in driving up the cost of housing. Overlooked by many was a potential source of relief. With more help from Washington, our guest took note of the opportunity, and that has since led to initiatives by the Boston Housing Authority and the Department of Neighborhood Development. To bring us up to date is the District City Councilor representing Beacon Hill, Back Bay, Fenway, and Mission Hill, Kenzie Bach. Thank you very much for being with us, Councilor. Thanks so much for having me, Chris. Councillor, uh, this sounds like a, a sort of a, a gold mine for the city. It, you know, you could have this additional public housing with subsidies from the federal government. Uh, that does not seem to be the story in most other cities around the country. So what's different about Boston? So actually what happened was in 1999, the federal government said, freeze at this point, it's called a fair cloth limit. You can't build any more public housing units past the number you have in 1999. Um, but after that point, Boston actually did a lot of redevelopment that unfortunately removed public housing units. So today we're about 2,500 units below that limit. Um, and so what's so interesting about that is it actually means that if we add them, the federal government is obligated to give us operating support for every one of those deeply affordable units up to 2,500 more, which would be another 25% of our public housing portfolio. It'd be, you know, we've got 50,000 families on the wait list we'd be able to get 2,500 of them into homes. Well, uh, one way to, to uh, deal with this is sort of to turn back the clock to you know the earliest days of public housing is that you get some land, the city acquires it, and you put some buildings on it. But these days, I think you want to think outside that box too, maybe. Absolutely. We want to think about this as an opportunity to add deeply affordable units in all the city's neighborhoods and all kinds of different places. So for instance, um, you could look at, at taking existing IDP units and making them more deeply affordable. You could mix them into mixed income housing. You could talk about the city's been looking at putting housing above libraries, fire stations. You could put some there, scatter them in. And you could also add some on public land and traditional public housing sites. But I think the goal would be really to think about all these different options. There's even the option, frankly, of acquiring an occupied apartment building that's maybe going on the market and providing a lot of sort of existing naturally occurring quote unquote affordable housing now and making it permanent for the long term. So it's, it could be a really versatile tool for us. And what you described here, it, it sounds like some of these crisis situations that we've covered, you know, we're, we're, uh, renters are in a building, they've been paying for, for many, many years, all of a sudden there's a change of ownership and, and the, the, the rent costs go through the roof. So, I mean, this potentially could be almost like a kind of emergency response for the city. Definitely. And I think what's exciting is it could make the emergency response sustainable. So say we put together a bunch of city money in our AOP acquisition opportunity program to get an apartment building like that, which is something the Department of Neighborhood Development has been working on. Combining it with this subsidy could make us know that we are going to be able to keep it affordable for folks for many decades to come. Um, and I think that's really the, the moment we're facing right now is how do we respond to the continuing emergency crisis and think about how we respond sustainably so we've got that kind of housing stability and equity for the long term. As I mentioned, uh, the BHA is working on this, uh, the Department of Neighborhood Development. What exactly are they doing? Yeah, so I've been really enjoying partnering with both agencies. So the Boston Housing Authority is doing a capacity study to look at all the places on its land where it could potentially add these. Um, and the BHA has got quite a large land portfolio. So there's um, some interesting places, including really mixed into the neighborhood. Um, and then DND is going to be issuing a request for proposals, and that's the Department for Neighborhood Development. They're going to be issuing a request for proposals this uh, spring to look at kind of some of those more imaginative ways we could use it on the private affordable housing side, including things like those apartment buildings. Councilor, what I also see here is a potential for, for people actually building this housing to have more job opportunities. Is, is that come into play too? Absolutely. Um, and I've been pushing hard the idea for the last few years that we really need to expand capital spending on housing um, because it's such a critical piece of our public infrastructure. And, and that really is why it's called public housing. It's a public good. And it's about knowing that, you know, if your family were to hit really hard times, unexpected job loss, et cetera, there's a social safety net. Um, and that's something that we backed away from in this country, I think, for a long time. And we have an opportunity to now reinvest in. And absolutely, that has to be a piece of, you know, the city capital budget funding those projects and those being good jobs for Boston workers. One other uh, item that you're working on with some of your colleagues in the council is the payments in lieu of taxes. And, you know, these are things paid by, it could be universities or hospitals or, or other kinds of uh, nonprofits. Uh, 
one thing that surprised me is it seems that, that most of this um, value is, is in the form of community benefits. And I guess you want to look at the way uh, we measure that value. Why do we need to do that? Yeah, so um, our institutions, large uh, nonprofit land holding institutions, um, we ask them to pay this pilot payment in lieu of taxes. That's uh, just, um, it's 25% of what they would pay if they were for profit owning that land. And then we say, oh, and half of that you could provide in community benefits. Um, and uh, and those community benefits can be really varied right now. And some of them are sort of critical things that we need that substitute for city services. And I think those are really the kinds of things we want to see people doing. Real opportunities for our young people, programming in Boston public schools, um, access to low-income health care, all kinds of stuff. And then there's things that... Um, you know, can feel a bit more sort of random or assorted, or it's it's not as clear what the direct value to the residents of Boston is, or um, or how to measure that value. And I think what what we're looking at, I filed this with uh, Council President Janey. What we're really looking at is in COVID, we saw what it looks like when all of our hospitals, universities, all of our nonprofits get together and coordinate around a response to a crisis. And there's been unprecedented, you know, bed sharing between the hospitals. You know, we used facilities, we used suffix dorms to house homeless folks, right? It was a real coordinated response between the public and the private institutions. Uh, and I think that, you know, as we go into recovery mode, thinking about the economic and racial equity crisis in Boston in the same way and asking our partners, hey, when we talk about community benefits, instead of just having a bunch of different proposals that are not connected up, how do we connect them to those most critical needs of the city um, and really make them measurable and, and focus on, on you know, affecting positive change with those community benefits? I think that's where we want to drive the program. So I'm really excited for the conversation. I, I know one of the difficulties is that when, when you're evaluating benefits, you, you want to make sure you're comparing to apples to apples and you're being fair about it. But on the other hand, these are institutions, including ones that normally make a lot of money, uh, that are right now going through a real rough patch and it might continue for a while. So how does that enter into this project? Yeah, so I think that's part of why we're focusing on the community benefits offset piece. Um, and I also think that um, I think we're all super mindful of, um, of the hard time that the institutions have had. And I, I would add, especially our, our arts and cultural institutions as well, who are also included in this. Um, but I think what I've found talking to a lot of the institutions that are in my district um, is that, you know, those institutions boards are also talking about the deep equity challenges we have in the city. And yes, we're going to need to be coming back and recovering. And we need to do that institution by institution. But also, everyone's fate is tied up with the fate of the city and whether Boston is a good and equitable place for all and for families from all walks of life to grow. And I don't think any institution or its leadership sees success and rebuilding in a context that isn't paired with that kind of um, rebuilding in the city. So I think, I think this partnership is essential and I think everybody's um, sort of coming from a place of goodwill in relationship to that. Uh, one of the places where you have to think about uh, equity these days is in public transportation and specifically the number 55 bus. Uh, what have you been doing with that? Yes. So the whole council joined me in a resolution yesterday um, objecting to its suspension, which is set right now to go forward by the MBTA on March 14th. Um, I'm hugely frustrated by this. The MBTA decided this cut in December. It then promptly received hundreds of millions of dollars from the federal government, and yet it's still going forward with the cut. Uh, and I really want to humanize this for people. So I have a whole bunch of low-income seniors who live in the West Fenway in an area that's ringed by quite large roads. And a lot of them have mobility challenges. Um, and a lot of them rely on the 55 bus. It's sort of like their line out of the neighborhood. So it stops right in front of St. Cecilia's house, which has 200 units of seniors, a bunch of Russian and Chinese speaking seniors who haven't been going out because we told them to stay home in the pandemic and who are not understanding and receiving the MBTA's communications because they don't speak English primarily. And now they're starting to get vaccinated and start to think about re-engaging their social life. I've got Chinese seniors who would go to Chinatown. I've got um, a constituent who lives next door in the McBride house with folks with HIV AIDS who says, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I guess I have to come up with a whole new medical provider because this has been how I get to MGH. Um, and these are really people for whom the fact that the bus stop is in front of their buildings is critical. Like even a short journey on foot is really hard. And the T is kind of looking at the overall metrics and saying, oh, it's a relatively small number of people using this bus during the pandemic. We'll just suspend it um, with no promise about how or when it will ever come back. And it's just unacceptable for my constituents. So it's talk about transit injustice. I, uh, I'm really hoping the T is going to reconsider. They have 
reached out and offered to meet with our folks. And so we're hoping, you know, to set that up. And, but what really matters is what they end up doing with the line. And it, it's so important to the people I represent. Things could be very different a year from now as well. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's always great to be with you, Chris. And good to see you again. District 8 City Councilor Kenzie Bach will have more news in just a moment.